Picture this, it is May of 1940. The wind is gently blowing through the grass, lifting up the scent of lavender and roses. The sun rises over the small, soundless town of Terezin, and the citizens slowly begin their day. The song of a bird can be heard in the distance as each man and woman does their part in the village. A single butterfly flutters through the air and stops on a leaf. It is the last one to be seen for a very long time. In a time of great rivalry between the Austrian and Prussian empires, military leaders within the so-called Habsburg Empire undertook the design of a military fortress on the road between Dresden and Prague. The fortress was to be situated at a confluence of the Elbe and Obre rivers, located 25 miles outside of Prague. Carl Clemens Pellegrini, an Austrian general, designed an elaborate, barrack-fortified garrison consisting of a small fortress on the eastern bank of the Obre River, designed to be a prison and an elaborately fortified town. The project took a whole decade to finish and was completed in 1790. Emperor Joseph II of the Austrian Empire named his fortified town Theresienstadt, Theresa's town, after his mother, Empress Maria Theresa of the Holy Roman Empire. It was only after the formation of Czechoslovakia following World War I that the town came to be called by its Czech name of Terezin. Along with two names and two fortresses, Theresienstadt also has two histories. The main fortress never came under direct siege by the Prussians, nor anyone else, but the Austrians maintained a military force there until the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918. The small fortress had a different path to follow. A solitary shot can be the spark that ignites the world into a terrible conflict. The streets of Sarajevo are festive and full as a motor car makes its way through the street, carrying Franz Ferdinand, Archduke of Austria, and his wife Sophie. A young man weaves his way through the crowd. He would later say, I only know that I fired twice, or perhaps several times, without knowing whether I had hit or missed. The man was Gavrilo Princip, a young Yugoslavian nationalist who assassinated the Archduke and would pay for it by a life sentence in cell one of Terezin. He would stay there until his death four years later in 1918. Terezin was semi-peaceful throughout the 1920s and 30s. It suffered as the rest of Europe suffered, but not in any special way. The town folk would go about their everyday business with no special airs. The Catholic, Jews, and Orthodox would all consort together. It was a normal town, a normal town that would soon be steeped in the blood of the innocent. In late 1941, the German Reich designated the walled town of Terezin as a Jewish ghetto. Jews of all sorts, elderly, veterans, artists, musicians, the blind, the deaf, and inmates of Jewish mental hospitals and orphanages were to be deported to Terezin. It served both as a prison and as a deportation base. There, they would be held before being transported to extermination camps. On June 10, 1940, the Gestapo took control of the decrepit fortress and created what would be known as the Theresienstadt Ghetto. Within four days, the camp was ready and the first prisoners began arriving on trains. It wasn't until a year later that the ghetto was officially ready, but by then it was already a busy hive of activity. The camp was presented by the Nazis as a model camp. However, it was in fact a checkpoint between the first transportation and the ultimate destination of extermination camps such as Treblinka and Auschwitz. A total of anywhere from 32,000 to 100,000 Jewish prisoners lived for some time in the ghetto. The transition from fortress to concentration camp was overseen by Siegfried Seidel, the first camp commandant. This transition was not performed by any of the SS or Gestapo, rather the manual labor was provided by the Aufbach Kommando, a group of 343 Jewish masons, carpenters, and laborers who were promised special treatment for their help. They did get special treatment. One morning in September of 1944, all of the team members of the Alpha Commando were rounded up into a train and sent off. They suffered immediate gassing once they arrived at Auschwitz. But Seidel would not escape from justice. In 1947, after the fall of Hitler, Seidel was found guilty of treason and war crimes and was later hung in Vienna, Austria. Ironic, considering that many of the Alpha Commando were Austrian Jews. Theresienstadt was also a hub for Nazi labor. Instead of being murdered immediately, blind prisoners would be forced to work with mica. Others would build coffins and boxes, or dye Axis uniforms white for the troops going to Siberia. Many of the survivors would later state that, The worst thing that we had to do was the sorting of clothing. We all said nothing, but we knew that they were from other Jews, Jews who died in the camps. In total, about 97,000 Czech Jews were in the ghetto. Of that number, 15,000 were children. Of that number, only 132 survived. Between January of 1942 and October of 1944, 63 transports carried 88,196 prisoners from Terezin to extermination camps in the east. 
Sometimes goodness can spring from the harsh realities of atrocities. Nearly as soon as the ghetto was set up, the Jews founded their own council to govern themselves, known as the Cultural Council. This council was led by many elders throughout its years of operation. The first of these great men was Jacob Edelstein, a Polish political activist. His leadership was followed by Paul Epstein, the main Jewish voice in Germany, who would die on Yom Kippur. With the death of Epstein, the council saw a progression of numerous elders, all that would die in Auschwitz or other concentration camps. The resilience of these men, among others, would help shape the post-war Jewish community. Secret classes would be held during labor hours under the ruse of theater rehearsals. There, the former teachers would educate the young prisoners on mathematics, politics, and sciences. Frederica Dicker Brandeis would hold art classes. When she knew that her transportation to Auschwitz was looming, Brandeis accumulated over 4,000 pieces of poetry and artwork that the children of Terezin made and stashed them in a suitcase that was given to Raya and Glandarovna and Hannah Brady. The prisoners would not only teach each other, but actually put on musical performances. Hans Kraza wrote his famous opera, Brundebar, which was performed by the inmates. Raphael Schachter would conduct Verdi operas and hold over 10 performances. Alice Herz Summer would showcase her piano skills in over 100 performances. Thousands of pieces of art, works of poetry, and music were created by the incarcerated. These pieces still live on to this day to prove the heroism of these forsaken people. By 1943, Theresienstadt had become a mecca for the deportation and extermination of Jews, Romanis, and homosexuals. By this time, the citizens of the ghetto were being screened for what the Nazis called prominent people. Those selected would receive a single room and special treatment from the guards. Oftentimes, these would be artists or philosophers. Neurologist Sigmund Freud's very own sister, Esther Adolphine, was one of these so-called prominent people. The extent of the Nazi rule was furthering its grasp, and with greater power comes greater opportunity to fall. The fall was just around the corner. Unlike most foreign Jews, these men, women, and children were not forsaken by their country. King Christian X demanded that the Red Cross be allowed to visit the ghetto and see the living conditions for themselves. The Nazis readily agreed. The Red Cross workers stepped off the train outside of the small fortress town and were welcomed by the joyous shouts of its citizens. Small children lined the entrance, singing operatic songs created by the prominent citizens. The Red Cross, guided by the guards and the painted red strip on the road, passed by Jews sitting outside of cafes drinking coffee. Candy shops and bakeries were filled to the rim with sweet-smelling treats. The neutral party met the mayor, Paul Epstein. Orchestras, quartets, and more filled the town with a melodious air. The citizens were quiet and did not talk, but seemed happy enough. The Red Cross was pleased and left Terezin. The success of the Red Cross's visit led the Nazis to decide to create a propaganda film, which they intended to show to neutral countries and to the Vatican to demonstrate the horrible slander that the Allies had been spreading around. In 1944, the SS told former film actor and inmate, Kurt Garan, that if he and a cast of other Jews were to make the film, they would be saved from any deportation and murder. They all quickly agreed. Under the supervision of Hans Gunther and Karl Ramm, Garan set out to write the screenplay. Upon completion, filming began on the 90-minute film. The film showed Jews playing games, sitting around and relaxing, and listening to orchestras and bands. Children were seen running through the streets with sweets. The film was intended to make Terezin look like an everyday, prospering, industrious town. A week after completion, however, Garan and his team were herded into a train and sent to Auschwitz, where they were immediately gassed. The film was set to be released when Hitler was defeated by the Allies. But, the Nazis, knowing their reign was up, destroyed the majority of the film and it wasn't until over a decade later that the remaining 20 minutes of the film resurfaced. On April 15, 1945, the 413 surviving Danes were released on the request of King Christian X. A couple weeks later, on May 2nd, the Red Cross finally took control of the camp, and within the week, the SS guards remaining at the camp fled, fearing for their lives. On May 8th, the sullen faces of Jews remaining at Terezin were seen by the liberating Soviets. After over five years of imprisonment, the Jews were freed. They returned to their broken lives and somehow found a way to move on. On May 10th, the camp was converted into a prison for Germans. Many Nazis came through the door, and many of them would die in the same cells that their hatred had created. It was not until three years later, on February 29th, 1948, that Theresian stat officially closed. It left a dark history with the death of thousands, but it also left a rich history of how humankind can rise above the awful situations that they are in and survive to tell their story.
the last, the very last, so richly, brightly, dazzlingly yellow. Perhaps if the sun's tears would sing against a white stone, such such a yellow is carried lightly away up high. It went away, I'm sure, because it wished to kiss the world goodbye. For seven weeks I've lived in here, penned up inside this ghetto, but I have found what I love here. The dandelions call to me, and the white chestnut branches in the court. Only I never saw another butterfly. That butterfly was the last one. Butterflies don't live in here, in the ghetto.